Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And I've mentioned this before in previous episodes, but I am an unapologetic Lakers fan. And Magic Johnson is still my favorite player of all time. Growing up in Southern California during the Showtime days, I hardly ever missed a game on TV. Watching Magic play basketball is what made me a fan of the entire game. He is the reason I am so passionate about basketball and its history. For me, it all goes back to Magic Johnson. As a Lakers fan in the 1980s, the arch enemy was Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics. Those were intense battles anytime these two teams matched up. Their matchup in the NBA Finals in 1984, 1985, and 1987 were legendary. The scariest sight for a Lakers fan back then was Larry Bird with the ball in his hands in the final moments of a close game. That dude was cold-blooded. So when they got a chance to play together on the Dream Team in 1992 at the Olympics, it was the first time that I could openly and genuinely cheer for Larry Bird. It is because he wasn't wearing a Celtics jersey. On his chest was USA, just like Magic. There was a play about six minutes into the first game against Angola. Angola shot a three-pointer but missed. Magic grabs the long rebound and starts the fast break. He pulls a spin move at half court to get around his defender. He continues dribbling straight to the basket. The defense starts to collapse on him. Just as he gets to the free throw line, he jumps up and throws a no-look pass over his shoulder to Larry Bird, who was trailing the play. Without even taking a dribble, Bird catches the ball and steps right into a three-pointer and nails it to give the Americans an 18-7 lead. I jumped off my couch after seeing my very first Magic Johnson no-look assist to Larry Bird for three. What other play could have been more perfect for these two players? And I start to yell at the Angolan team through the TV, you can't leave Larry Bird that wide open and not expect to pay for it? I was in basketball heaven. That newfound affection for Larry Bird's game is what led me to today's story. Today, we are going to talk about the first time that Magic Johnson and Larry Bird were teammates. Most people think that the only time they were ever on the same team in a competitive situation was on the dream team that I just mentioned. Others might say that they played together in one of Magic Johnson's charity games in the mid-80s. And they did play in that game, but it was an exhibition game. It was for charity. It really wasn't all that competitive. Also, Magic picked the teams, and he always wanted Larry Bird to be with him on his squad. But that wasn't the first time they'd ever played together. For this story, I need to take you back all the way to the summer of 1978, when both players were still in college. Larry Bird had just finished his third year of basketball at Indiana State University and was a first-team All-American, meaning that most people considered him to be one of the five best college players in the nation. Magic Johnson had just finished his first year of college basketball at Michigan State University, but was already lighting college basketball on fire with his no-look passes, and he earned third-team All-American. So, during that summer, there was an international tournament scheduled called the World Invitational Tournament, or WIT. It wasn't any sort of official FIBA event, 
It was a made-for-TV event to showcase young American talent and to see if an American audience had an appetite for international basketball outside of the Olympics. The tournament was sponsored by Converse and the trophy was called the Converse Cup. The four teams invited to play in this thing were the United States, the Soviet Union, Cuba, and Yugoslavia. It was a round-robin tournament meaning that everybody played everybody else. The winner of the tournament was whichever team had the best record after all games were finished. Back then, the United States did not have a standing national team like every other country had. Every time the United States played in an international basketball competition, they always started from scratch on how to put the team together. The first thing they had to do was select the coach. Now typically, it was a college coach that was selected since back then the United States had to send its best amateurs. NBA players were not allowed to play in international competition back then. So that meant sending our best college players to compete at the Olympics, the Pan Am Games, the Goodwill Games, the World Championships, and events like this WIT. The thinking was that a college coach was best suited to lead college players in this type of competition. Also, the international game resembled the American college game more than it did the NBA, what with zone defenses and a shorter three-point line. So, the committee selected Joe B. Hall of the University of Kentucky to be the coach in this event. His Kentucky team had just won the college national championship, so it made sense that he would get the opportunity to coach the team. Also, the committee allowed Coach Hall to bring his five starters from Kentucky with him to the WIT. This meant that he could just start his regular five starters from Kentucky and run the Kentucky offense and defense. And I don't totally blame them for that decision. It wasn't like this team was going to have months to prepare for the tournament. They only had about a week to get ready for it. So bringing the coach and five starters from the best college team in the country made sense. The five starters that Coach Hall brought with him were Jack Givens, Rick Roby, Kyle Macy, James Lee, and Jay Scheidler. Givens played two seasons of NBA basketball for the Atlanta Hawks, averaging just over six points per game. Rick Roby played eight seasons in the NBA, mostly for the Boston Celtics, where he teamed up with Larry Bird and averaged about seven points per game. Kyle Macy played seven seasons in the NBA, mostly for the Phoenix Suns, and he averaged around nine points a game. James Lee and Jay Scheidler never played in the NBA. But those were the starters, and they got the bulk of the minutes since they were already familiar with the Kentucky system that Coach Hall was running. The bench players were made up of some of the best players from the rest of the country, but they barely played at all in this tournament even though the bench players absolutely dominated the starters in practice every single day. Led by Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, the bench team, or second unit, won every single scrimmage they played. And it wasn't even close. While Magic and Bird were the playmakers in the second unit, some of the other players in that second unit were Sidney Moncrief from the University of Arkansas, a two-time Defensive Player of the Year in the NBA, a five-time All-Star, and he's in the Hall of Fame. It also had Daryl Griffith from the University of Louisville, who won the NBA Rookie of the Year and was known as Dr. Duncanstein. David Greenwood was from UCLA, and he made the NBA All-Rookie Team and played 12 solid years in the NBA. Phil Ford came from the University of North Carolina, and he was another NBA Rookie of the Year. These were some really great players on this second unit, and Joe B. Hall pretty much ignored the second unit players. Even Magic said years later that he had never been ignored like that by a coach before. There was another time at practice where Coach Hall was trying to drill the starters on how to break the full court press, which was a strategy they were anticipating from the Soviet Union. Well, Bird and Magic tried something that Bird called the Rat Trap, where Bird would force the dribbler to his weak hand, meaning the dribbler would have to spin to protect the ball. Just as he would go into a spin, Magic would come up for a hard double team. With two six foot nine guys in your face, the dribbler's only option was to pass out of the double team with an overhead pass. Magic and Bird anticipated the overhead pass and simply jumped up to steal it 
and they would take off on a two on none fast break. Nobody told Magic and Bird to do this. They did it on their own using only eye contact to communicate understanding and it worked every single time. Kentucky could not get the ball past half court. Eventually, Coach Hall blew his whistle to stop the drill and was so furious that he just moved on to a different drill. He never addressed or tried to correct what the Kentucky players were doing. He just moved on. All I know is that if I'm the coach of that basketball team and I watch the second unit dominate my starters day in and day out, eventually I'm going to turn to that second unit and tell them that they are the new starters. But it's just my competitive nature. I'm going to play to win, especially at this level. But Coach Hall trusted his Kentucky guys. He was going to live or die with those guys playing the lion's share of the minutes. But for Larry Bird, dominating the starters was a bit of revenge for him. When Larry Bird was in high school, he was recruited by Joe B. Hall, who invited Bird and his parents to come to the University of Kentucky for an official visit. Bird was really taken by the campus and the basketball facilities. It was the only school outside of the state of Indiana that he would have considered going to. But after the visit was over and he returned to his hometown in French Lake, Indiana, he was notified by his high school coach that Kentucky was no longer interested. Joe B. Hall felt that Bird was just too slow to be successful at Kentucky. Bird took this opportunity with this tournament to show Coach Hall what he was missing out on. And man, did Bird show him. Now, this is a good place to take a break. I'll share the story of the actual tournament right after this. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and let's continue with the story of the first time that Magic Johnson and Larry Bird played together as teammates. The tournament experience gave Magic and Larry a chance to get to know each other because they were going to be together for around three weeks. Practicing and playing in this tournament was a great chance for them to learn each other's game. Unfortunately, Larry Bird is a very shy and quiet person. At least he was back then, and he kind of still is today, especially as just a 21-year-old college player. The two of them never really had any meaningful conversation. It was basically just hello and good morning. On the other hand, Matthew Johnson was the life of the party. He was always playing his stereo in the hotel, on the bus, in the locker room. He was high-fiving everyone and getting to know them, and he really connected with Moncrief. But on the court, Magic and Larry were practically telepathic. What both of them recognized in the other instantly was that they each saw the game differently from everyone else. And they saw the game the same as each other. Both of them played the game two or three steps ahead of everybody else. When they looked at each other on the court, they recognized something very special in each other. But before I describe just one particular play that they had together on the court, I want to mention that both Magic and Larry were still developing. At the time, nobody would have said that there go two future Hall of Famers, or that there go two of the ten best players of all time. They were not there yet. Both were still a full year away from entering the NBA. But here is a taste of what it was like between them. On one particular play against the Russian team, Bird saw the flight of the Russian player's shot and already knew that the shot was not going in. He anticipated the angle of the rebound and was already moving into position to rebound the ball and immediately began dribbling up court with his head up to see what options he had for the fast break opportunity. Magic, seeing what Bird was doing, was already sprinting down the right side of the court with his hand up because he was open. Except Bird was not even looking at Magic. He was looking to the left as if something really interesting was going on over there. So Magic was thinking that Bird was just not seeing him. And then it happened. Larry Bird absolutely whips a behind the back pass directly into Magic's right hand. Magic then crosses over his defender to occupy him for just a second and then fires a no look pass over the defender's shoulder right back to Larry Bird. As the ball is still on its way to Bird, 
Bird sees Magic's defender turning to try to make a defensive play on Bird. And that's when, in that split second, Bird decides to touch pass it right back to Magic again, who makes the open layup. The crowd went nuts with excitement. They just saw these two players execute a behind-the-back pass directly to a no-look pass to a touch pass for the layup. That was just a taste of what they would do in the NBA for pretty much the entirety of the 1980s. But for the entire tournament, Magic and Bird played only about 10 to 12 minutes per game. Basically, they only entered the game to give the starters from Kentucky a rest. As soon as the Kentucky guys were ready to go back in, Magic and Bird were sent to the bench. But to be fair, and I do try to be as objective as possible when telling these stories, the team didn't really need Magic and Bird to play that much. Even though the second unit dominated the starters every day in practice like I mentioned, the starters for Kentucky were strong enough to win that tournament. And they did. The team beat Cuba in the first game 109-78 in Atlanta, Georgia. Then they beat Yugoslavia in a much closer game 88-83 at Carmichael Auditorium on the campus at the University of North Carolina. And then in the final game, they beat the Soviet Union easily, 107-82 to in a game played at Rupp Arena at the University of Kentucky. They purposely scheduled that final game to be played at the University of Kentucky, which gave the starters and the coach the opportunity to play in their home arena in front of their friends and family. Overall, it was a successful tournament for the Americans. I mean, they did win it. You can't do much better than that. And as all of the players went home for the rest of the summer, Larry Bird told his older brother that he had just played with the best basketball player he had ever seen. And that player's name was Magic Johnson. For Magic, he had just played with the only other player who understood the game the way he did. It was a revelation, and he looked forward to getting back on the same court with him again. And that would happen only nine months later when Magic's Michigan State Spartans and Bird's Indiana State Sycamores played each other in the national championship game, which Magic's team won 75-64. to That game is still the highest rated televised college basketball game in American history. It was also the last college game that either of them would play as both entered the NBA the following season. But for those eight days in the summer of 1978, you had two of the greatest players of all time playing together for the first time. And that was the beginning of their lifelong rivalry and eventually their friendship. Well, that's it for today. Join us next week when we talk about major rule changes in basketball during the second 50 years of the game. These rule changes are a great way to see how the game developed between the 1940s and the 1990s. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that will help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts, as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Lawiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. And don't forget to check out sportshistorynetwork.com for more information on my podcast and the rest of the podcasts on our network. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. 
To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.